Praise the 
the Lord this morning. God, I'm thankful for a bunch of people who are excited about the God that they serve. And they are not ashamed to praise you in the congregation. Thank you, Jesus, for this day. May all things be for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shake hands with someone before you sit down. I'm glad to have you, missionary girl. Thank you, Jesus.
started here. I'm so glad that you enjoy each other's fellowship and your shaking hands and, and getting to know one another and all of our visitors here. God bless you for being here. We really appreciate you choosing Missionary Grove Baptist Church to worship with us this morning. Uh, we want you to know that we're all about Him and this ain't about us. So uh, if you're here, I hope you enjoy yourself. I hope you get connected in a way that maybe you haven't been before. And hopefully you'll see some faces you know. The home folks, you always make sure uh, that you greet all those that you might know or you might not know, you might not recognize. Matthew chapter 7. And we want to talk about more proof that we are saved today. Um, I've preached over the, uh, since the beginning of the year in 1 John. And I preached through the whole book of 1 John about knowing that you're saved. Knowing that you're saved. You've got to know you're saved. You've got to know that you know Jesus. You cannot mess this one up. You cannot take a chance on dying without Jesus Christ as your Savior. The Holy Spirit indwelling you and enabling you to be what God's called you to be. Um, and, you know, if you are come here... Um, we first are about the lost being saved. Jesus' first goal in life was not to take care of religious people. It was to see the lost saved. So we're going to take care of seeing the lost saved, number one, here at Missionary Grove. That is our goal, is for us to see people come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because if you die and go to hell, it doesn't matter how much of the Bible you know. Amen? Amen. You need to know that you know that you know Jesus. So... That's what it just been on my heart. I talked to a friend of mine last night and just kind of confirmed that. You know, it's uh, days are not getting any longer. Amen. In fact, days are getting shorter. We've all lived probably longer than we should have. Amen. Amen. Yeah, my daddy said he should have killed me years ago. You know, uh, and my mom was the only reason my daddy didn't kill me years ago. I'll be honest with you. You know, we've all lived uh, probably longer than we should have and we've all done things we shouldn't have and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, rightfully so that if we died without Jesus, we would go to hell. But God in His grace and mercy sent His Son that we celebrated at Easter and we celebrate year-round to save our souls. And our first goal after we are saved should be to tell somebody else how to get saved. Um, amen? Amen. Man, you ought to be telling people how to get saved. Yes, I mean, if people are dying and going to hell on your watch, I mean, you need to figure out how to fix that problem. We've got to figure out how to see people saved. It's last days, last times, uh, last things are happening. We understand all around the world that, that we know that Jesus is coming back. The Scripture proves that He's coming back. Times and prophecies prove that He's coming back. And we need to be ready to meet Him. We need to have everything in order. Um, we need to know that we know that we know we're saved. Because in verse 21 of Matthew chapter 7, Jesus taught this way, Not everyone who calls out to Me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, only those who actually do the will of My Father in heaven. They will enter. On judgment day, many will say to Me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in Your name and cast out demons in Your name and performed many miracles in your name, but I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's law. Father, help me to preach as Jesus did with authority and power. God, may the power of the Holy Spirit rest here as it did in the New Testament. May the same thing that happened in the Scripture happen here. May lives be changed. And may you be glorified. Use this time to build your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. When John the Baptist was baptizing people in Luke chapter 3, he said these words, Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Prove by the way you live. Not by what you say. Because what you say doesn't mean something if you do the opposite. Amen? Amen. You know why people, you know, people say, well, just, you know, used to, you could just... Give them a handshake and say, I'll do it or I'll be there and that was good enough. You ever heard that saying before? Well, in the Scripture, it's not about what you say, it's what about you, what you do that makes you who you are, that makes you proof of who you are. You say, well, I thought you teach that you can't get to heaven by works. I do teach that. And I'll stand by that. The reason I say that is, John said, proves by the way you live that you have repented. He didn't say, live this way to gain repentance or live this way to gain righteousness. He said, live in a way that is worthy of the repentance that you so say you have. 
Now, what I'm doing today is just making sure we understand that the way we live proves who we are. And we've heard this over and over again, but I'm just going to take Jesus' words. We went with John. Now we're going to go with Jesus. You know, all the people in Abraham's day said, we're Abraham's descendant. And John looked at them and he said, I can create Abraham's descendants out of these rocks right here. doesn't matter who your grandfather was, if your granddaddy was a preacher, if your mom or dad was a preacher, if everybody in your family is saved. If you're not saved, you will miss heaven. doesn't matter how you were raised. What matters is that at one point in your life you had a meeting with the Holy Spirit that led you to Jesus as your Savior. And in John, I mean, excuse me, in, in, yeah, in John chapter 3, John the Baptist said these words that Jesus is coming to separate the good from the bad. The judgment's coming. And he said he was going to do it like a winnowing for it. And we don't do a lot of wheat. I, I don't know that I've ever seen this happen, but. Jewish people would have known what he was talking about. When they gathered wheat, they threshed the wheat, they put it in bundles, they brought it to a threshing floor that was a big platform. And then on the flat, uh, platform, they had a winnowing fork, which was kind of like a pitchfork. So they would run that pitchfork into that wheat, and they would throw that wheat up in the air, and the wind would separate the wheat from the husk. Therefore, separating the wheat from the chaff. Now here's what God's saying Jesus is coming to do through John the baptizer. He's saying Jesus is coming and He's going to sift the saints. Yeah. Like, he's, like everybody in church is not saved. Like everybody who claims to be saved is not saved. And in this time, in this day, through the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit being poured out on all, all flesh, then Jesus is taking that Holy Spirit and He's tossing our worlds up through the power of the Holy Spirit, everything around us is being shaken until nothing that will be not shaken can be shaken and we will see in the end who is and who ain't. Like this is the end. Times, listen, and even if Jesus doesn't come back in the clouds with the resurrection of the dead, even if we don't see uh, the, the moving of Jesus through the clouds, the rapture, you're going to die. I'm going to die. I'm not going to live much longer. I'm just promised a vapor. I'm just promised a few days. So Jesus is saying, by your fruit you shall be known. Let's look at this Scripture a little more. I will reply to them, you know, I never knew you. Does Jesus really know you? Now skip back a couple verses. It says you can only enter the kingdom through a narrow gate. Verse 13. The highway to hell is broad, and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only few, hear me, only a few ever find it. Narrow. Jesus. The only way. Exclusively the only way. No other ladders. No other path. It's not going to be easy the life He's called you to live. But He is the only one that can save you. And the life that He calls you to live has proved that He has saved you. Very few ever find it. The majority of people who claim to be Christians in America are not. It's hard words, but true. Few. So why would I be so urgent in my message as to go to this length and say you've got to be saved because more people are going to go to heaven and think I'm good, I'm in, and God's going to look at them and say I never knew you. I don't know you. I never knew you. I never talked to you. I never walked with you. I never supped with you. I never gave you my Holy Spirit. I never sealed you. I never knew you. And it's going to be the very people that have said all their years they're saved, that have done all the right things and said all the right things. See, God is sending men of God and churches into the world today to say that what you think's always been okay is not okay anymore. And this is what God expects. And these are who are saved. The tree is being shaped. You need the truth. You don't need somebody. Listen, I understand. I want all the good things. I want all the blessings of God. But first off, a church ought to be about seeing people saved and then teaching those saved people how to enjoy those yeah. blessings yeah. of God. Yeah. 
Like lead them into their fullness. Abundant life, I'm, I'm all for it. But we got to make sure the sheep are in the pasture. we got to make sure the sheep are hearing His voice. We've got to make sure that the door's been opened and Jesus has come in. He's the only way. And there's a lot of people telling other stories. Like in verse 15, even in that time, Jesus said, Beware of false prophets in chapter number 7. But today I also want to tell you that by our fruit we are not also. See, we know there's false prophets. And, and they do it for gain. There's hirelings. There's people who preach the Word of God just because it is a job. Did you know that? Yeah. Not every man stands behind the pulpit or a woman. They're not all of God. There's a lot of false teachers and false preachers in the last day. You will be deceived if you're not careful. I mean, listen to me. There is false all around and by your fruit. Somebody can say I'm saved, but what am I doing to prove that I have the kind of faith that will save me? James said that faith without works is dead. That kind of faith cannot save you. Faith that just sits there and does nothing cannot save you. That is not saving faith. It is a faith that does the things of God. Here's the Word of God. Is the person that God wants them to be. And they have that and that enables them to be such. So the axe is poised. The things are going to happen. Severing the roots. The tree will fall into eternal damnation. The fire is hot. Heaven is sweet. Jesus said He will save you. It's your choice. It's like the difference between putting your hand in a fire or, or eating apple pie. I mean, which one are you going to choose? I mean, come on. Like everything in my body screams, if you don't know if you're saved, why would you not get saved? Yeah. That's right. Like if you don't know Jesus, the thing, the very person that loves you more than anybody on the earth, the very person that gave his life, the one that says, I will not let you burn in hell over my dead and resurrected yes. body. I've done everything that you need in order to be saved. Why would you just not say, Yes, Lord? Preach it, brother. Like I don't, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to burn in hell. I don't want to be without God for all eternity. I am ready to be what God has called me to be. How are you going to know if you're saved or not? Verse twenty-one. Not everyone knows that. Not everyone knows God, but you can identify them by their fruit. Verse sixteen says, "Identify them by their fruit, proving what you've done." Proving that you've trusted in Christ. Your life ought to prove that you have the Holy Spirit residing in you. Your life ought to be different by our fruit. And that means visible. Now here's what I'm going to say. We all know what we shouldn't do. Amen? I mean, come on. We've been around long enough that we even have a sense of morality even if we're lost. We know that... We shouldn't commit adultery. We know we shouldn't commit a fornication. We know we shouldn't steal. We know we shouldn't lie. We know we shouldn't covet. From the time we're born, even if we don't know God, there's a moral law written on our heart. We understand there's things that we shouldn't do. Right. Now, but what about the things we should do? Church has always been hung up on what you shouldn't do. And then we base our salvation off how good or how moral we are versus what about all the other commandments where Jesus tells us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every living creature. Not doing that is just as bad as doing something else He told us not to do. So the do's are just as important as the don'ts. Like we gauge ourselves about how good we are if we're saved, but what are you doing to advance the kingdom? What are you doing to see people say, what are you doing to show the world that they are lost and that Jesus Jesus is the light. How are you living that will show them the truth of the Savior? See, you are not going to be able to come to Missionary Grove and just sit in a pew. Amen. We're going to get you to do something or we're going to run you off trying. Amen. There's no more sitting down. We've said for too long, the kingdom awaits. The, the end is near. We've all got a job. We've all got a place. We are all an integral part of the body. So we've got to serve these things. Prove our service. Proves that we are children of God by our fruit. What is your life producing? Literally, it means a pickable fruit. There ought to be hanging from each side of your limb something that a lost person can walk up to and pick off of you to know that you are of God. Like your church and your life and your family and everything that you are ought to have good 
fruit, bearing good fruit. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. Not a little fruit, but a whole bunch of fruit. And it will be evident to everybody else around you. And it ought to be evident to you. If right now you're looking at your life and you can't find any fruit, you need to see where you're rooted. You need to make sure that Jesus is the Savior of your soul because a tree that doesn't bear fruit, the Scripture says, an axe is laid to the root and it is chopped down and thrown into the fire. So a good tree produces good fruit. Amen? Amen. What is that good fruit? Well, we could go to Galatians chapter 5 and we could go through the fruit of the Spirit. We could say that when you are a child of God, like we know what we don't do, let's focus on what we're supposed to do for a little while, okay? I know I'm, I know the bad. I've done about all of it, okay? I know what I'm not supposed to do. But how am I going to know like love and joy and peace and long-suffering and goodness and meekness and temperance and and joy, just peace overwhelming inside of me. Think about the fruit of the Spirit. Ephesians says that you are sealed unto the day of redemption with the Holy Spirit. You are given the well. And then you will move to greater heights as the river of the Holy Spirit starts flowing in and through you. And knowing you're saved is by seeing these fruit of the Spirit come out of you into the community you're living in. You can't just base your salvation on by what you don't do. What are you doing for the kingdom? Who are you leading to Jesus? What about the turmoil at work? Are you being peace in the middle of it? What about the deaths all around us? Are you giving people joy in the midst? What about all the things that are going on? The world falling down around us? Are you being peace? Are you loving those who are unlovable? Are you treating those kind who have never treated you or said a good word to you? Think about all the things that a saved person does. Think about all the things that God's called you to do if you are saved. I need to pray over this mic. Somebody does. If you believe faith can heal a blind man, it can sure take care of this microphone. Verse number 18 says, A good tree can't, cannot produce bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. How many of you have messed up in the last week? So how are we going to dig into this one? We just want to dig in it. Like, there's a, as a preacher, a lot of times I have more questions than answers, okay? I'm going, well, what's this mean? I look at it, I think, God, you're going to have to reveal to me what this means. I want to preach the truth of your word. I don't want to add to, I don't want to take away. I just want to say what you say, nothing more, nothing less. If you look the word produce up in the Greek, the original language, it is continued. A good tree can't continue to produce bad fruit. And a bad tree cannot continue to produce good fruit, to practice. This is differing from a single act. This means to perform repeatedly. This means habitually. This means to abide in. This means to live in. A good person, a righteous person, can't live in sin, and a sinful person can't be righteous. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Now, we all know that we mess up. We all know that we have struggles and, and trials. And sometimes my biggest fault is unbelief. Sometimes I'm just like, I don't know or I don't believe. or You know, I have these issues that I'm going through all the time. And I'm thinking, God, I'll read Your Word and it says that a good tree can't produce bad fruit. But I know what You said. I know Your Spirit lives inside of me. So what this means is this. If you are saved, you won't continually do the same sin over and over that's always held you back. You will break the bondage through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, a lot of people think that there's a lot of things that the Holy Spirit can't do. And I'm going to tell you right now, there's nothing He can't do. Yeah. Like if you've got something that's got you in bondage, the power of God gives you the ability through the Holy Spirit to break that bondage. It's over the power of sin, and one day over the presence of sin, but it's sure over the penalty of sin. Like I am free from that, if there's something holding me back, I can quit doing it. And if I can't quit doing it, there's only two answers. 
either I'm lost, either I'm lost, or I haven't engaged the power of the Holy Spirit and appropriated it to that place in my life where this can happen. There's a lot of things I can't do on my own yeah. that I try to do. Anybody ever tried to do something on your own and failed? Yeah. And then you had to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit to bring you through that place, to put you where you needed to be. A good tree produces good fruit. A bad tree produces bad fruit. In the same way that a good person can't live in sin, a bad person, which means an unrighteous person, a person that doesn't know God, can't be better. <laughs> See, I experienced this in my young life. And the turning over a new leaf does not work. Doesn't work. You'll be good for a little while, but you'll end up being bad again. There'll be no consistency to what you're doing. If you don't have Christ, what Christ brings is consistency. What Christ brings is the ability to be what you need to be all the time. And what bad is, is when you don't have Christ, when you're not able to quit what you're doing. If you've ever had something that you can't quit what you're doing and prayed and prayed and prayed about it and you still can't quit the power of the Holy Spirit, you say, I know that I need to quit, but I can't. You need to see what's going on. There's a spiritual problem in there somewhere and you need to know what's going on inside of you in order to step away from those things. You can't abide in God and abide in sin. You can't abide in sin and abide in God. Those are mutually exclusive. Now, verse 19, why is it so important to get this right? So what if you miss it? Well, I'm a pretty good person. Or I don't beat my wife unless she needs it. You know what you... I better quit while I'm ahead. I don't... You know, I don't go out and get drunk or, you know, let's just make a list. I don't, I don't commit adultery. I don't commit fornication. Now, there's a few things in and of myself that I don't do. Now, think about this. Is that good enough? Is it good enough just to be good? Absolutely not. See, there's people that were good in the New Testament that Jesus is talking about here. The Pharisees and the scribes, the Sadducees, the religious crowd. That the religious crowd gave more trouble to Jesus' movement than anybody on earth. Not the sinner. The sinner heard, believed, repented, True. and followed. True. The religious people said, No, we don't want to do it like that. We've always done it this way. We can't do it like that. We've got the law. We've got this. We know what we're supposed to be doing. We've added all this thing. You know, in Acts chapter 15, they were trying to make the new Christians become circumcised. The Jews were. And Peter and them looked at him. He said, let's make it as easy as possible for them to be a part of us. Let's not add to it. Let's make it where they can come in and be a part of the fellowship. But the religious crowd was always getting drunk. That's the ones he's talking about here. The ones that say, Lord, Lord. The ones that say, Lord is Master. The ones that think they've got it all together. The ones that supposedly might have prophesied in the name of the Lord. They might have healed people. They might have cast out demons. See, Jesus talks to a religious crowd just like we're doing this morning and says, you might not have it right, but you better get it right. You say, well, we're all saved. Nobody knows. I don't know that. I don't know that. So my job is to preach the Gospel and then let God move in you through the power of the Holy Spirit and then you get saved and then you grow in Christ and then you preach the Gospel. And so there's a bunch of religious people sitting around saying, we've got it together. And Jesus said, when, I, when you get there, He won't know you. Because it's just been lip service. Isaiah was quoted in Matthew. John quotes Isaiah when he says, They honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. You think about that for a minute. Is this what you say or is this who you are? Come on. There's a difference between just like I'm a good person or I like, you know, anybody can talk a good game at church. Amen? Hey, brother, how you doing? Everybody can say, brother. If you can say, brother or sister, you can act like you're one of them. Amen? I did it for years. I'm telling you, all of my life, I acted 
facade, fake, whatever you want to call it. I did it for years. I said, this is who I am. But I really wasn't ever saved. It wasn't my heart. Who cares? Listen, right now, if you're playing games, don't let your pride get in the way of really getting Jesus. Who cares what people think about you? You've been here 40 years or 4 years or 4 days. It doesn't matter what anybody in this pew thinks about you. All that matters is you getting right with God. So don't let anybody ever hinder you from coming to true faith in Christ. I don't care if you're a part of a committee or a board, whatever it is. You've been a stalwart in the community. You need to know that you know that you know Jesus. You don't need to take a chance of standing before God and Him saying, I do not know you. Religious people will stand before God weeping because they never had a heart transplant from the power of God. They knew who He was in their mind, but they never turned towards Him. He said, live in a way that proves that you have given your heart and life to Jesus. Don't worry about what everybody thinks or what's gone on all these years. Make sure that you know Jesus before you leave this place because the only other option is on Judgment Day you will be cast away. He will say, I never knew you. You who stood here and said you loved God, but you did all the things that were opposite of what God called you to be. Your identity is known in your actions. Your identity, who you are, is directly tied with what you do. What comes out of your mouth comes directly from your heart. Don't try to detach. Oops, I made a mistake. Listen to me. There's a dark place. When something's coming out of your mouth that's not supposed to be, that means there's darkness in your heart that the Holy Ghost needs to shine a light on and needs to be removed. Out of the, out of the mouth, out of the heart, man speaks. Nothing accidentally slips out. It's been in there. You just let it out. Hear me. Know who you are. Know you're saved. Know you're a child of God. How are you going to make it? How, I mean, is there any chance that any of us make it? Now, verse 24. Matthew chapter 7. Let's read this together. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follow it, follows it is wise. You say, I want to do what's right. I want to be what's right. I want to be a good husband. I want to be a good wife. I want to be a good church member. I want to be a good person in this community. Well, listen to Jesus, okay? Get your foundation right. Like a person who builds a house on a solid rock. The solid rock. Now let me talk to you a little bit about that rock. Foundations are the most important things to buildings. You look at a house. Today we build houses. And sometimes we compact rock. And we get it so tight. We test the compaction rate. And then we lay slabs on top of it. We pour concrete, put rebar in it, and we shore it up. That way, when we put that house on it, it's not going to move. Or sometimes you dig footers, and you dig way down in the ground until you get solid ground, and you pour concrete, and everything on that house is built off of those footers. It will rise and stand on those footers, on that foundation. But in Jesus' day, it was a little different. It's called a cornerstone. In Jesus' day... They didn't have the concrete that we had. They didn't have the ability to do what we did. So when they built a building, they went out and got a big rock called the cornerstone. And they set it, hear me, listen, they set it in the corner of the house. And everything about that house, the rest of the stones, all the brick, all the whatever they put on it, that was based off of that one stone. Everything was plumbed by that one stone, lined up, squared. It all was done from one corner stone. Now the man who builds his house on the rock, the cornerstone, the person of Jesus, our whole lives have to be based off of one person. That is the person of Jesus Christ. He is the cornerstone. He levels us. He plumbs us. He gets us right. He gets us in line. Everything that we need to do, everything goes back to that one stone. And then you are the little stones. There's a big stone that's set in the corner that the whole foundation is built up. And then you, as you are saved, you become the little stone. Peter's name was Petros, which meant little stone. When Jesus looked at Peter and said, Who do men say I am? Peter said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You're the big rock. I'm the little rock. And Jesus looked at Peter and He said, Upon this 
Revelation, I will build my church. What did he mean? He meant on the revelation from heaven that Jesus is the cornerstone, the foundation of all we do. Unless you get the cornerstone right, the house will fall. Look at these words. Listen. Though the rain comes in torrents and floodwaters rise and wind beat against that house, it won't collapse because it's built on the bedrock. How many of you would like something sure in life? Huh? Yeah. All around us is shifting saying, I'm telling you right now, if you build your house on Jesus Christ, if you put your faith in the Son of God, no matter what comes against you, your house is going to stand. That's right. Not maybe. It says it will stand. Torrents, flood rise, all hell is going to break loose on earth. Things are going to happen that we never imagined. There's going to be wars. There's going to be rumors of war. There's going to be divorce and adultery and fornication and perversion. All these things. The devil's going to try to destroy you. He's going to try to destroy your family. He's going to try to take you captive and lead you away. But if your house is built on the rock, it will stand. It will. Not maybe. Not hopefully. It says it will stand. But anyone who hears my teaching, listen, if you hear it and you don't obey, it is foolish. Like a person who builds their house on the sand. The rains are coming. The floods are coming. All of this is going to beat against you. All hell is going to break loose on earth. You will think the worst things and they will happen. And your house will collapse and it won't just be a little deal like a shed falling over. It says that it will crash. It will fall down around you. There will be nothing left unless your place is on that rock. You can't survive the storm that's coming unless you've got Jesus. You can't weather what's coming unless you are based upon that solid rock. You say, why are you acting so crazy? Because it's life or death. It's heaven or hell. It's once, forever, and always. Or it's never. This is our only chance. Today. Today. Not tomorrow. Not later on. Not a couple hours from now. Right now. Right here. In this place. Today is the day of salvation if you won't harden your heart. You can't leave here today not saved. You can't take that chance. You can't. The floodwaters are coming. The world's getting worse and worse. Everything's going to happen just like the Bible says it. Evil men will wax worse and worse. False prophets, deceivers. It's just going to implode until God comes back and sets up His kingdom one day. And you want to make sure that you're on the train that's coming back when the new kingdom comes, okay? You don't want to try to ride out the storm. There'll be some people saved in the tribulation period, but it'll be, they'll be saved by their head being cut off. They won't get to just choose God by their free will right now. Right now, by your free will with your own admission, you can claim Jesus Christ as Lord and salvation from your soul, but one day that will all stop. That's right. You can have a church that makes you feel good. You can have a church that makes for sure that you're saved. Once we get that figured out, we'll all feel good for all eternity. That's right. Don't miss it. Don't play around. Know that you know. Be saved today. In Jesus' name. Let's pray. move this morning is this. If you are saved and you know somebody that's not saved, would you come pray for them right now? If you're saved and you know somebody that's not saved, would it mean enough to you to come pray for them right now? Get down on your hands and knees and weep before a holy God. The Scripture teaches that those who go forth weeping, bearing precious seed, which is the Word of God, will no doubt come again rejoicing, bringing the harvest with them. You will weep.
your heart will be moved over those who are lost. God will see your crowd. He will hear your prayer. And He will save the lost. Many people right now weeping, crying. You know somebody that's lost it all break your heart. Now, no, nobody's looking around. All heads bowed, all eyes closed. Is there anybody right now, just me and you, I'm looking at you. Nobody else is. Would you raise your hand right now and say, I want to be saved? Is there anybody right now that would raise their hand? It's just me and you. It's just me and you and God. This is the most important day of your life if you know you need to be saved. Just raise your hand right now. You say, I need to be saved. Anybody?